Baldur's Gate 3 has been out for over two weeks now, and some of us are ready for our second playthrough. Some maybe are just getting started, or if you're like me, you've put 100 hours into the game and are nearing the end of Act 2. Whatever the case, you might be wondering what kind of character should be your next playthrough. Well, in this video today, I'm going to give you some suggestions for classes, multi-class combos, and races to give a shot in your next or even your first playthrough of Baldur's Gate 3. The way I'm going to structure this video is by showing uh, the level up screen for a character so that I don't spoil the game if you're brand new or ruin experiencing things for the first time. I know a lot of videos will show off a lot of gameplay for such things, but some seeing something like Eldritch Blast for the first time in game for me was an awesome experience and I'd hate to rob anyone of that experience. So we'll just be showing off the leveling up screen and I'll be talking about some of those abilities and how they play into the game. If you're new to my channel, the way I do things is by upfronting the knowledge of my videos so you can find the entire list of what I'll be talking about in the timeline of the description. Basically, we'll be discussing the Dark Urge, uh, a series of multi-classes, some monk builds, and then the races Githyanki, Dwegar, uh, and Deep Gnomes. If none of these interest you, or maybe you've already played them, then please feel free to shut the video down. I don't want, I want you to get back to enjoying the game as fast as possible. Before you head out, please don't forget to like, comment, and or subscribe. Each one of those things does help me out in a very huge way, and I would greatly appreciate it. Lastly, don't forget to shoot me a follow on Twitch, where I will be streaming Baldur's Gate 3 and plenty more. Well, let's get started here on starting your second character in Baldur's Gate 3. To start this video out, let's have a quick discussion about what you have probably already chosen. So taking a look at the stats from Larian, they've showed us that the majority of people are playing half-elf, human, or just a normal elf. And the majority of people, class-wise, are choosing paladin, sorcerer, and warlock, which are all great classes. Um, in fact, a lot of those are going to be in this video here today, and it's a lot of multi-class combinations. So I just want to show you that these are the way that most people are skewing a lot of their characters or what they're choosing for a lot of their classes, and none of these are bad choices. I want to make that very apparent up front. If you want to go through your second playthrough and play a paladin again, then do it. If you want to go through in your second playthrough and you play it as a cleric and you want to go paladin, please do it. I don't. There, there's nothing wrong with playing the popular choice in either of these categories. What I'm going to be highlighting here are stuff that's a little bit more off the beaten path because maybe you didn't even consider it was an option or maybe it's something that is not as apparent. And especially when we talk about monk today, we're going to talk about monk in two different iterations. Monk is very different in Baldur's Gate 3. Even playing stuff like the Ranger and the Beastmaster is very different in Baldur's Gate 3. It's actually really good in Baldur's Gate 3. That's my main character is a is a Beastmaster. So I want to show this off here really quick to just to have a discussion about what you probably have already played or what you've seen most people play and what maybe isn't as popular. And what it doesn't mean, again, that there's nothing to be done with those. There are things that can be done in the game as a monk, a druid, and a cleric that you can do with no other class, especially the druid, man. You can do a lot of really cool things if you shapeshift into a cat or a mouse and go into places that you otherwise were not able to get into. Uh, although there is no druid in this video to talk about, that is worth mentioning. That there are portions of the game you've probably never been able to access or use because maybe your character was too large to fit into them. Well, the druid can take advantage of them without being a small race if you don't want to be a small race. Oh, hey, you know, it's a little tiny pipe. Well, a mouse can crawl into that. So being any of the druids, they can all shapeshift and go into any of those things. So consider this when you're taking a look at your next playthrough. Let's jump into some multi-class combinations and thus of. Before we break into the actual classes, I want to talk about some really good race options to go into first. Um, the first one, I, I forgot to talk about in the intro because almost all my characters are drow or half drow. So I figured, oh, everyone else is like that, but that's not the case. Um, the drow is a very fun race option. And maybe you don't necessarily see yourself playing the typical loth sworn drow, which is typically uh, evil. But maybe you want to do a Seldarin Drow, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, I don't know the pronunciation proper, which is more of a Drow that lives on the top, not the Underdark. And you aren't necessarily evil. But what makes Drow so cool is, yeah, sure, you get the weapon proficiencies of Rapier, Short Sword, and Hand Crossbow if you maybe didn't have access to them. Dual wielding Hand Crossbow is a lot of fun. Superior Dark Vision's cool, and Fey Ancestry, and Bannon Saving Throws against being Charmed, that's great. But... There are a lot of weapons and armor and items in the game that are drow specific. If you're a half-elf drow, you don't get to benefit from them. And there's a lot of conversational things that you'll be able to take advantage of as a drow that 
almost no other race gets advantage of, or gets to take advantage of because the story is geared towards certain elements happening. If you've already gone through the game, you have already understand how much you interact with drow. So being a drow, you get a lot of different ways to play through and experience this if you actually play as one. So it is a strong recommendation for me. It is my personal favorite race in Faerun. Um, well, I guess it'd be on Dark End and Faerun, right? Outside of that, too, is the Deep Gnome, which is similar, right? The Gnome itself gets Gnome Cunning. You have advantage on Intelligence, Wisdom, and Charisma saving throws, which are all actually very nice to have advantage on. Also, with Deep Gnome, though, you get Superior Dark Vision, but you get Stone Camouflage, so you have an advantage on Stealth checks. So if you're playing any of the stealthy characters that I'm going to talk about and recommend, a Gloomstalker, a Rogue, anything of the sort that's really going to be sneaking around a lot, even if you go with a Shadow Monk, Getting this advantage on um, stealth checks is really cool. And the reason I'm bringing up a deep gnome is because I think most people would probably want to go with a dwarf of some sort. Maybe they're going to go halfling because they get the halfling luck capability, which is really goddamn good. I think most people wouldn't think to choose a gnome. And you interact quite a bit with deep gnomes um, if you've already played the game. And I, I hope that's not a spoiler for you. Damn it. Uh, well, either way. Um, but... Being one is quite cool. And there's also points in the game where you can only access if you are a small race. So being a small race, like a gnome or a halfling, you get to experience the game in a very different way. And that's why I think it's a really cool one to take a look at. Now, moving up just barely out of the uh, small races into the dwarfs, we get the Dwegar. Now, Dwegar are quite cool. They are, again, another under... I, I know there's a theme here. I've just talked about three of the Underdark races, but they're, they're, they're very, very cool and interesting. So Dwarfs himself get Battle Axe, Hand Axe, Light Hammer, and War Hammer proficiency. Dark Vision, and then Dwarf and Resilience for advantage on saving throws against poison and resistance to poison damage. You, you actually deal with a considerable amount of poison and fire damage in the game, so having advantage on those is always quite nice. But this, you have advantage on saving throws against illusions and being charmed or paralyzed. That's another layer of... Um, insulation. But what makes the Dwegar pretty cool here is with this special, with this proficiency, battle axes and war hammers, you can take advantage of this as a caster. So you can be a caster like a necromancer or any other type of wizard or sorcerer or what have you and actually just jump right into using a pretty hard hitting weapon. And that's a pretty cool way to kind of take a look at things. That's something we're going to talk about in just a little second here going to the Githyanki. And I, I think that's, or Githyanki, which I think is really fun, is, is trying to break that mold of simply being, okay, I'm a sorcerer, I'm a wizard, I've got a robe, and I've got a uh, staff. Well, maybe you take that in and go, okay, I'm going to go wizard and I'm going to branch out into fighter for two levels to get action surge. But now I actually have access to medium armor. So I can wear medium armor, have a battle axe or war hammer, and still be a casting wizard or, or sorcerer or what have you. Heavy armor shuts that off, but still, it's fun to play around with. And lastly, this brings us to the gith. Now, gith, I think the one problem I have with the gith is I visually do not like them. And I think it's why they are the lowest uh, played race. I think a lot of people can't really kind of get their head around it. Um, I think, honestly, the female gith looks way better than the male gith. I, I, and even look at Lazelle. Lazelle is actually a pretty badass looking character. And this guy just looks like he wants to buy crack rocks. So the big <laughs> thing here is gith gets a lot of really cool things as they level. And I haven't talked about the abilities you get with her gnome, dwarf, and drow as they level up. Because the gith ones are, are, are particularly poignant. Um, astral knowledge is cool. So you gain proficiency in all skills of a chosen ability. Meaning, let's go to abilities. Let's press change. So if I press if I if I press that button and clue and choose strength, that's athletics and acrobatics. But you know what? Maybe I'm gonna press that button and I'm gonna choose charisma. And maybe I'm not a charisma character. Maybe I'm playing a barbarian or a fighter and I'm not touching my charisma at all. And I don't have the bonuses here. Well, deception, intimidation, performance, and persuasion are all charisma ability skills. So tripping this off is going to give me proficiency in them. It starts off at a plus, and proficiency, remember, is a plus, you get your proficiency bonus. At this current state in the game, at level one, that is plus two. But that comes out to three, and then eventually four. So you get four in that of uh, deception, intimidation, performance, or persuasion if you have no charisma points. If you do, you get even more, right? You'll get your innate ability score plus your proficiency bonus. These are really great ways to pull a lot more out of this 
uh, race that you don't, maybe you're not specialized in these specific skills. You get a lot more out of it. And on top of it too, Gith, get this, a lifetime of relentless training gives your armor proficiency with light and medium armor, as well as proficiency with short sword, long sword, and great sword. So since there are no specific ability scores tied to your race anymore, right? You, you choose your plus two and your plus one, then playing a Gith sorcerer or a Gith wizard, or I don't care, a Gith warlock gives you access to these proficiencies of both armor and weapons right out the gate you don't need to be a packed blade warlock and then you still get short sword long sword and great sword you get access to light and medium armor which you would otherwise only have access to light armor or maybe you want to jump into bard all these things gith kind of opens the door for you and it's something that i think that most people probably wouldn't even think to look at because of the gith now uh, you do get Mage Hand, but you eventually get the ability to jump super far. They get like their Psychonetic Jump or whatever it's called. And I think it's uh, a 3x jump. They can jump three times as far. So you can get to all the jump little puzzles in the game pretty easily using a Gith just innately by leveling them up. It is one I think that a lot of people sleep on, but... Once you can get over the physical look of the character, I mean, I mean, probably just randomize it. <laughs> We're getting wild. But once you can get over the physical look of the character, you really can have a really fun one with your Gith Yankee. Or Yankee. Gith. Gith. Just a Gith. I'm going to call it Gith. I'm going to muck up the pronunciation more than I already have. To start us off, and I'm using Shadow Hearts armor because it's like the least spoilery armor I can think of. Um... We're going to talk about the monk, and the monk is one of those not really played classes. We're going to go through specifically the way of the four elements. So this is a monk that's going to be using dexterity uh, for majority of its damage, right? That's how you're also going to be using to cast your spells as we push through this. Now, if you've never looked at monk, monk is an unarmored class, very similar to, say, the barbarian. You can wear armor with the barbarian, but that's not really the goal here. With the monk, you get things like an armor defense. While not wearing armor, you add your wisdom modifier to your armor class. So it stands to reason, just like a barbarian wants high constitution and a considerable amount of dex, the monk wants high dexterity because that's how their unarmed damage is being done and a considerable amount of wisdom to get further bonuses to their AC. Um, then you're going to get dexterous attacks. So again, an armored attack scale with your dexterity instead of your strength if your dexterity is higher. Death strikes, mo the uh, attacks with monk weapons. And unarmed attacks deal 1 to 4 bludgeoning damage until their normal damage is higher. And then bonus unarmed strike. So after making an attack with a monk weapon or while unarmed, you can make another unarmed strike as a bonus action. So basically out the gate, you get extra attack if you want to think of it, if you're unarmed. But as you kind of progress through this... You'll see that when we push into the monk level 2, we're going to get some more fun stuff. We get our first key point, or an additional key point, sorry. Now, key is interesting in that it is used as a resource for you, depending on which of your three subclasses you choose. And this time we're taking the way of the four elements. Think of them almost like casting slots. You'll use them to cast your spells as where the four elements is geared towards basically casting monk magic. But you'll get a lot of really cool things like bonus actions that allow you to disengage, to dash, and you get patient defense here. Against your attack rolls against you have disadvantage and you have advantage on dexterity saving throws. So you become quite a nimble little little person just like Rogue does, right? And you move faster. On armored movement, you increase your movement speed. I'm a wood elf, so I go even faster now. But as we push into level three, we get access to our subclass with Way of the Four Elements, and this is where things get really fun. So, for also too, you get Deflect Missiles, which is awesome, right? Use your Dexterity Modifier plus your Monk level to help deflect against ranged attacks. Harmony of Fire and Water, because I've chosen Way of the Four Elements, which allows me to regain half your key points rounded down, rather than doing a short rest. Key points regenerate every short rest, and this Harmony of the Fire and Water allows me to regenerate key points without resting this is a, a once per long rest ability but then i get these spells and you might recognize some of these spells fist of four thunders it's just simply thunder wave uh blade of rhyme you know these are, are pretty basic looking abilities here right like sphere of elemental balance it's just chromatic orb um a hurlless sphere that deals through to 24 lightning damage and possibly crisis surface on impact so sorry it's not chromatic orb um but still you can see that these are very similar looking but then you get stuff like this fangs of the fire snake hit your foe from afar your next melee attack deals an additional one to four so it's a 20 foot range on this bad boy or fist of unbroken air push the target back and knock it prone or shaping of the ice create a climbable ice cube you have all these really awesome capabilities here 
as a uh, four elements monk. And this gets crazier and crazier as you push through it. It's a very fun class that I think a lot of people sleep on because they're like, ah, what am I going to do with this guy? I'll just go ahead and play um, an actual... Um, I'll be definitely a war caster here. Uh, I'll go play like an actual casting class. But no, the monk gets to take advantage of all these really cool abilities in every handful of levels. Um, it's level 6, level 9, and level 11. You get even more spells to take advantage of. You get extra attack too, so you're doing even more damage. You get stunning strike here for... You have certain monk weapons that are considered melee, but I'm mainly just talking about the, uh, the unarmor abilities here. But also at level 7, you get access to... A very spicy thing called evasion so we're going to choose one more spell here i'm just going to choose it and keep pushing through um but at level seven here we're going to get evasion which is very very nice and it's a very nice ability so evasion your agility lets you dodge out of the way of certain spells when a spell or effect would deal half damage or effect would deal half damage on a successful dexterity throw it deals no damage if you succeed and only half damage if you fail so it allows you to have even more tank ability and the monk is a character i just think that a lot of people probably look at as it's probably not going to be very tanky it's probably not going to do a lot of damage i'm probably not going to have a lot of fun casting spells but it's got a ton of fun built into the package so take a look at the monk of four uh, way of four elements especially if you go with a bald monk Find a certain cabbage vendor in Baldur's Gate 3 is all I'll say. Is all I'll say. You have to make your character bald and they have to be a monk. But those two things keep them in mind. Sticking with the monk, we're going to talk about the way of the open hand, but we're going to take a different approach here. So going into our ability score, remember we talked about how dexterity and wisdom are very important for monk? Well, let's read this one more time. So on our defense... Uh, again, this is your wisdom modifier as well as your dexterity modifier are factored into your AC. But also dexterous attacks. Attack with the monk weapon. Attack with monk weapons and unarmed attacks. Scale with your dexterity instead of your strength, if your dex is higher. So what you're doing here is you're trying to pull a lot of strength into your character because you're going to use the tavern brawler uh, feat, which will basically double your strength modifier into your attacks. So you get to choose here. Do you want to go like this, or do you want to do this? So it's basically just a difference of, do you want to go with like a 17 or, or 16 uh, dexterity? You're going to get plenty of ways to benefit both of them. There's plenty of ways to increase them. But you want to go with something heavier in the strength department because once we get to level 4, we're going to increase it with tavern bars. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So again, subclass, we're going to be choosing way of the open hand, which is really focusing on your unarmed damage. Then we're going to push here into level 4 and choose our feet, which is going to be Tavern Brawler. Now, this is better than it was in tabletop. So when you make an unarmed attack, use an improv Im improvised weapon or throw something, your strength modifier is added twice to the damage and attack rolls. You can see that right here. And then we get to choose one more to constitution or one more to strength. We're going to push up our strength because our strength right now is plus three to strength checks. Now it's a plus four. So this doubles it, right? We get plus eight. It's juicy. It makes it so that our unarmed attacks are absolutely devastating. We can do just absolute karate chops in the face here. I'm just going to go ahead and press back and take a look at what our unarmed strike is. And I'm not even all the way leveled up. This is going to be 9 to 14 plus 8 there, right? Because it is a unarmed attack that we're using. Otherwise, this would say plus 4. Now, of course, as you level up and go through, you would have this be a higher number and everything like that. And I'm just showing you what it would look like here at level 5. But still, my point remains. The open hand um, subclass for Monk with Tavern Brawler is a wrecking house. Next up is Lockadin or a Paladin and a Warlock multiclass. My really good friend Remortis just made an amazing video on this. I'm going to link that in the description and the uh, pinned comment. He has, it's like a 27 minute video and he really goes into all the nitty gritty. So please go check him out. He's an up and coming YouTuber with some great information on this, this subclass, or I'm sorry, this uh, uh, multiclass. But you would so go ahead and choose a class for Paladin and you want a spread of strength and charisma because you're going to be pulling from your capabilities as a Paladin, which are very charisma centric. And then you're going to be pulling from your capabilities as a warlock well you guess it's also charisma centric this is a really good character too if you're playing your main character and you want to take advantage of any of the skill checks that are 
charisma related, all of those conversational ones. But you can still do this for someone like Lazelle. Subclasses though, uh, you have all three of the oaths to take advantage of, even the hidden one, the oath breaker. My personal preference is oath of devotion because you get holy rebuke, grant an ally a vengeful aura that deals one to four radiant damage to anyone who, who hits them within a melee attack. Oath of devotion, um, this is basically the tenets you have to apply but you'll have a, a smite, which we're going to take a look at in a little bit here. Um, every single paladin has to apply or has to follow their tenets or else they become an oath breaker if you did not know that. But Oath of Devotion will eventually also get Sacred Weapon, which we'll take a look at here at your your um, your channel oath. Let's now take a look at what the future of your, uh, your paladin looks like. So at level two, we're starting to spice into some fun stuff. We're getting our Divine Smite online with Radiant Damage, which is really good in a lot of portions of the game. You're getting your spells online. You get your fighting style of either great weapon fighting, defense, dueling, or protection, whichever route you're going to be taking here with your character. And you have a lot of options at your disposal, you know, Thunderous, all these cool things that you can take advantage of. So we're going to go ahead. I'm just going to choose, uh, I don't know, dueling. We'll go dueling and press accept here. And then you have a choice. You can either decide to stay as a paladin at level two, um, all the way up to level five, so you get your extra attack, or you can start spicing into Warlock at this point. Um, your, your point, you're your basically, you choose at level two, after level two to go into Warlock, or you take Paladin to level five to get your extra attack online. It's entirely up to you. But like I said, here's Sacred Weapon. Turns your weapon into a Sacred Weapon. You're probably wondering what that means. Wielder's Charisma Modifier is added to attack rolls made with this weapon. It's become a magical and it emits light. So your Strength Modifier of plus three now gets that Charisma Modifier of plus two. It's really goddamn cool. Now we're going to go ahead and add in a class here. And we're going to go with Warlock. And then we get all of our cantrips. <laughs> you know we're getting. We're, you know we're getting that eldritch class, that uh, that eldritch baby. And you can then choose too. Do you want to go fiend, great old one, arch fay? You have all these different options you can do. Mortal reminder here: when you land a crit hit against a creature, that creature and any nearby enemies must succeed a wisdom saving throw or become frightened until the next turn. So you get to then kind of spice out how you want this to be. Do you want to simply go with? Um, the the great old one. Do you want to do fiend? I, I mean, it's really kind of going to be up to you. I personally like the fiend because of the dark one's blessing and the progression point of the fiend and how this ability kind of spirals out and you get some other ones after you kill things. So when you reduce an enemy's a hostile creature to zero hit points, this gift from your patron grants you three temp hit points, and that's just here at level one. But this will this will expand out and give you more and more. If you've played with Will in a game already, you already see what some of these other fiend subclass features can be as you level up. But eventually, you'll get stuff like Dark One's own luck, which adds to your ability score scores uh, as a 1d6 on certain checks stuff like that a lot of really cool things that unlock with whichever one you choose uh, this is another thing that remortis was talking about too he was like i i go with the fiend i like it a lot more um and i definitely uh, echo that sentiment but cantrips too blade ward is really good because you're going to be in close combat anyway your spells here too you're going with arms of hadar or armor of uh, agathis whatever how you pronounce it these are just really great tools to add in to the paladin's already existing strong close combat kit and i strongly recommend it coming into our next level for warlock we're definitely going to go with our eldritch invocations and agonizing blast and repelling blast um, you can swap out other things in different locations if you so wish but agonizing blast is very good because it adds your charisma modifier to the damage that eldritch blast deals and it's a very good ranged ability for you so i would definitely go with that and then in our next location we now choose our pact as a warlock and this is where things are very spicy so one thing to also note is that warlocks have special warlock spell slots those spell slots regenerate whenever you do a short rest but they also can be empowered in the sense that a level one spell cast with a warlock spell slot casts at the highest spell level you can cast let me rephrase that if you cast a level one spell and you can cast level three spells if you use a Warlock spell slot, it casts at level three. It doesn't need to be a level three spell slot. If, if you're brand new to the D&D and that went over your head, don't worry, You'll it'll make sense as you jump into the game. Go ahead and just choose another thing here, but Pact Boon here, Pact of the Chain, the Blade, or the Tome. 
So you can really kind of decide how you go about this. Um, this will give you Guidance, Vicious Mockery, and Thorn Whip. Chain here is going to give you a Familiar, but Pact of the Blade is particularly nice because this gives us the ability to bind a Pact weapon So, or make a Pact weapon. You, you pretty much choose one or the other. So if you have a weapon you really like, you bind it, and now you're proficient in it, and you get the benefit of, be of it being a Pact weapon, meaning... There we go. Summon a weapon to your hand. It uses the wielder's spellcasting ability modifier, which is charisma for you, and its damage is ma magical. You are proficient with the weapon. You can only have one at a time. The weapon disappears, blah, 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 blah. So you can either make one out of thin air or bind one to you that you already are using. It's a really nice way to kind of, again, add more to the kit of Paladin. But here we're going on to Warlock at level four, just bringing this up to enough to get a feat, probably go with something like Warcaster, who knows? I'm just, I'm just choosing it at random here, right? Um, and again, I would go up to level five with our warlock because then we would get access to basically our next set of spells here uh, and our next Eldritch Invocation, which is which would be quite nice. So that is how your uh, warlock paladin would work. After you do this, you would just go back into paladin and carry it on into the future, or you'd start with paladin up to five and do your warlock into the future, whichever one makes the most sense for you. But I think you're really going to like the way that these two classes play with each other because there's just so much ways to make your close combat abilities absolutely rock house uh, and get hunger of hadar or hadar it's so goddamn good now our next option is the bard lock very similar to your lock it in right where you're using the charisma capabilities of the paladin and the warlock in conjunction well you're now doing that with the bard you're using your capabilities of bard alongside your charisma capabilities of warlock but you have two choices here do you want to be more of a lore and casting style of bard or do you want to be more of an up close personal warlock that has bard capabilities so if you want to go with the support bard you would start with a bard first and you'd go 10 levels into lore bard and then two levels into warlock uh probably choosing one of the packs uh conversely you would do five levels of warlock first and then seven levels of bard so you would go warlock to five you're going pact of the blade and then your seventh level uh, or you'd go into bard and choose bard college of swords up to level seven and let me just kind of show you again what that looks like you you this is actually this is actually a pretty good split right here i'm not gonna lie to you <laughs> this this will do pig um, maybe do that i don't know it depends on what kind of ability scores you want to take advantage of between intelligence and wisdom um and then kind of go from there. You, you start off, uh, we're going to assume you want to go with the support bard because I already have the archetype for the other one made for you. So you would go with this, we'd press confirm, we'd level up again, and we'd push ourselves here now into the respective college as we get access to it. Now, a cool thing here for Song of Rest is that you and your allies are revitalized as though you have taken a short rest. So it's a nice to have on either starting as a bard or spicing into bard later because just being able to get a hit points recover without actually having to rest is just a nice way to just get a little bit more out of things and i'm i'm guys i'm just choosing spells please i know like some some of these have choices i'm just kind of haphazard i'm just doing it to make my point throughout my videos here um like oh my god what am i ever gonna use that uh it doesn't again it doesn't really matter but now you're choosing your college, right? So College of Lore, you're really kind of going on that more, not necessarily even support route, but you're you're favoring more the casting portion versus Valor and Swords, which are more towards close combat or at least turning your Bardic Inspirations to combat focused things. So Cutting Words, use your wit to distract a creature and sap its confidence and additional proficiencies, gain proficiencies in Arcana, Intimidation, and Sleight of Hand. And I'm just going to Go ahead and press accept here and it just kind of pushes you through um, however you want to go ahead and make this character however you want to do these uh, cantrips and stuff like that and i'm sorry however you want to do these things maybe spell sniper there it is gives me an additional cantrip here i'm, I'm going to get eldritch blast so it's not really necessarily useful here maybe go with something like that i mean eldritch blast is still useful but still my point remains again i'm just choosing stuff to push me through and you're going to be able to then choose the branch out now into um your warlock and you can do that warlock here at level five after level five um because this is when you're going to get improved bardic inspiration at level five here and font of inspiration you regain all bardic inspiration after a long or short rest so it's a really nice way to get more bardic on inspirations 
per rest out of your character rather than having to wait all the way through to a long rest here. And that at, at five here, I could go spice two levels into Warlock if I want to get those abilities online, whatever it is. But you really want to take advantage a lot here in using your Bardic capabilities. So here's Will, and Will is set up to be the other end of that spectrum, right? That level 5 Warlock, you start off with Warlock this time around, and you get up to level 5, and then switch to Bard and do 7 levels into Bard. You'll choose College of Swords at level 3 Bard, and this is where you get to have some fun choosing how your character approach fights. Do I be more of a melee-centric character, or do I jump in heavy with my blasting capabilities from range because Pact, or I'm sorry, uh, College of Swords is gonna allow you to use your Bardic Inspirations on feints, which is very fun and cool and unique. And since this character does already have that capability, it's very cool. Now, what you also wanna take a look at too, uh, is that we've talked about this, but just to kind of show you, so my Warlock spell level is three. I can cast up to level three Warlock spells, but I can only cast level one currently um, bard spells. If I click this, I can choose a level one spell slot that will only regenerate on a long rest, right? Once per long rest. Or up the ante here on this bad boy and make it a level three warlock spell slot. Sure, I only have two, but they regenerate on a short rest. So in a big situation where I'm like, you know what? I, I just really need to do something big. All right, I've already done some of my other warlock abilities. I know I only have two. Let me get a big Dissonant Whispers out. So now my Dissonant Whispers goes from being 3 to 18 damage to now 5 to 30 damage. So this is what I mean in that you can really spice the way your spell slots work with Warlock and with Bard. And this is true of, of, of the Paladin that we talked about, but I just really wanted to show this off and how it really can be an amazing character for you to have fun with. Now the last one I want to talk about is the Gloom, Stalker, Assassin, or Thief type character. When you make your character, you're going to start off as a rogue. And the important reason behind this is you want to get access to sneak attack. Remember, sneak attack doesn't mean that you have to be sneaking to do it. You deal extra damage to a foe you have advantage against is what it means. So if someone's blinded, you get damage to them. And I think the, the, the formula for sneak attacks damages, it increases every odd number of levels, something like that. So this is a scaling damage that will get better and better as your character levels. Getting access to it at level one is crucial because also it works if an ally is within five feet of the target and you don't have disadvantage. So if you're stacked up with say Lozelle or any of you other more close combat oriented characters, you're still getting the advantage of using sneak attack. So you wanna get this online first. It's why you start level one as a rogue. And then after that, your ability score, you want to have dexterity high because you're a rogue. You're going on dexterity and finesse. Uh, you're going to have your constitution high because you will be up close and personal. And you're going to go with wisdom at 16 because we're going to be immediately jumping into uh, ranger, which uses wisdom as its capabilities. Now, I've kept charisma at 10 because I'm assuming you're making your main character this. But if you're, say, maybe doing this with a Starian or anyone who's not going to be doing conversation checks... So if you're to drop it, I mean, if you really want to min-max it, you definitely can and have a little fun and spice this around to maybe your constitution or other parts of this, this uh, the realm here. But I just want to let you know that you have that freedom if you, if you absolutely need it. So now that we've done that, after level one, you're immediately going to jump into Ranger. And Ranger is going to hold true here, even though if you stay rogue, you get your cunning actions, which is very good. I'm definitely not discounting them because basically this um, this allows you to attack something, cunning action, hide, and then the next turn, sneak attack. But that's not the role of this character. This character is going to be basically an ambush specialist. And then for favored enemy, I would choose maybe something like Bounty Hunter here. Um, you gain proficiency in investigation, which is really good in just the general world. Creatures you hit with ensnaring strike have disadvantage on their saving throw, which is very nice too. Mage Breaker's okay. I don't really like True Strike. Ranger Knight is cool if you really want to go with Heavy Armor, but Heavy Armor will put a penalty on Stealth, so be careful there. Um, this gives you Sacred Flame. And Keeper of the Veil is... I'm not really stoked on it. And then one of your uh, Natural Explorer ones, you should pick up for your skill, one of your skills, Proficiency in Sleight of Hand, so you don't have to get Urban Tracker. I would get one of the Wasteland Wanderers, because this gives you resistance to cold damage, meaning it deals half damage to you or fire damage or poison damage so 
maybe go with fire or pose poison personally. Um, and then from there, we just kind of keep leaning into Ranger. You want to get Ranger up to level 5. Again, for the same reason that we have for a lot of other melee classes, getting them to level 5 also gets us access to our extra attack. So we're going to go Archery here because what you're doing with this character is you're dual wielding hand crossbows. If you've never done it, it's so gratifying. It is so gratifying. And then for our subclass, uh, we're going to go Gloomstalker. Don't sleep on Beastmaster. Not for this situation. If you want to make a Beastmaster, you go pure Beastmaster because they get scaling uh, beasts at certain levels. But Gloomstalker is where we're going because we want Dread Ambusher. You specialize in taking out foes swiftly and ruthlessly. You gain plus three to initiative, meaning you're almost always going first. You are the Alpha Striker. You, on the first turn of combat, your movement speed is increased by 10 feet, and you can make an extra or you make an attack that deals an additional 1d8. Add that to your sneak attack. You're doing a ton of damage. Um, dread, dread Ambusher Hide. So remember I said, yeah, we want that cunning action. Well, you get it right here. Hide from enemies by succeeding stealth checks. Stick to the dark and avoid enemy sighting, attacking. This is a bonus action is what I'm trying to say. It's a bonus action hide. <laughs> and then Umbral Shroud. Wrap yourself in shadows to become invisible if you are obscured. And you also get Disguise Self. So um, you get some fun fancy abilities. And you can also get Long Strider, which is a ritual spell. What does that mean? It doesn't cost you a spell slot to cast. Uh, the Ranger Long Strider ability, it says level one spell slot here, but if I jump back down to the game, I can cast this on everyone. It lasts until a long rest, and then you can go ahead and have the entire party move 10 feet faster. It's, it's quite nice here. And then we would keep pro progressing this bad boy up to get our feet um, this is one that alert is very good. You gain a plus five bonus initiative and you can't be surprised. You already got a plus three, but you can take advantage of this if you so wish. But sharpshooter is going to be disgusting for you. Your ranged weapon attacks do not receive penalties from high ground rules and ranged weapon attacks with weapons you are proficient with have a minus five penalty to their attack roll, but deal an additional 10 damage. I cannot stress enough how awesome this really works, especially if you're going with like a drow, and you get that hand crossbow. You already get hand crossbow too, as being a, uh, a ranger should give you access to hand crossbow, I believe. Uh, but still, regardless, sharpshooter is going to be an amazing feat for you. And you would just take this all the way up here to level five, get that extra action. This one right here, extra attack. I'm just choosing spells here to choose spells. Oh my god! And then you jump back into glooms or uh, rogue to finish off your leveling process. And then again for Rogue, you would, you'd stick with Rogue and go either Thief or Assassin. You'd choose Thief if you wanna have more bonus action fun and a lot more world capability. Assassin if you wanna continue to be that Alpha Strike badass. So this is a really fun class if you wanted more of a stealth route and didn't wanna get up close and personal and have a lot of fun kind of maneuvering around the game. Now that we've talked about races, we've talked about classes, the last thing I want to talk about is origin. Now you can jump into the, any of the origin characters if you so wish, but the game will play effectively the same as it would for a custom, just with the added little bits of their specific story in mind. But what I really want you to try, if this is your second playthrough, if it's your first, definitely give it a shot if you want to, but it's the Dark Urge. And the Dark Urge is a very chaotic way to play this game in, in, in just lots of ways. And you can be completely, it's a custom uh, racing class. You can choose whatever the hell you want here. You don't have to be <laughs> a hulked out sorcerer. <laughs> Steroids. Uh, you don't have to be um, a dragonborn or whatever. But the Dark Urge also, you don't have to be evil. Uh, what I want you to really consider when you take a look at the Dark Urge is that it is a very demented way to play the game. The very opening portions of the game talk about putting your fingers through a brain. Like, uh, you've probably seen the little thing with a squirrel. I'm not going to say any more if you have not. But there are a lot of things in the game that you'll experience where your character has completely terrifying ways to approach things that are unlike the good or bad options in a normal playthrough. It is entirely different and you also get rewarded with items and things that you wouldn't otherwise not get if you did not choose the dark urge so it is a different way to play the game and i think that there's a really fun way to play it the way personally i'm going to approach dark urge is i'm going to be making a tiefling that is mephistopheles that is a monk 
and he's gonna go the the four elements and he's gonna spend the entire campaign resisting the urge and I think that's gonna be a really fun way to play or maybe you know what you go with a paladin and you're trying to stay true to your tenets while resisting this dark urge constantly telling you to like I don't know punch a child I, I don't have no idea I have not played the dark urge so I couldn't tell you so I think or maybe you give in and you become an oath breaker dark urge paladin there's a lot of really cool ways to approach the dark urge it's not just simply yeah 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 you're gonna be a really big dickhead no you can really resist this or you can give in when it makes sense like maybe you're playing uh, another example here would be you maybe you're playing a, a druid where I can't even find and and you're going down the circle of moon and 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 you 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 give in to whenever this makes sense for you to be mad about something as a druid but the dark urge pushes you just over the top maybe it's a, a, an otherwise pretty good playthrough but if you see someone like defacing nature you just go completely berserk there are so many fun ways that you can play this and i really encourage you to take a look at this origin if you've not done so yet but at that bros it brings this video here to a close so thank you so much for watching here today uh the trailer you're seeing right now is a three plus year old game trailer to the game this is not my b-reel so don't worry i guess necessarily about spoilers because a lot of this stuff has changed but um I really want you to play your second playthrough with a little bit more spice than your first. Maybe you played the first one very, not boring, but you played it very safe. You played a human paladin, you were the good guy, and you won the day. Larian has said there are tons of ways to end this game. There are hundreds, I think maybe even thousands, I don't remember, of endings. So experience it in a new way. You don't need to be the the, the ultimate evil person. You can be someone that's maybe a little bit more neutral. You can be someone that maybe is a little more chaotic good, which of course now we don't have those alignments, but still you can approach this in a bunch of different ways. And hopefully these spicy options for classes gave you a different route to approach this, or maybe some different race options or origins, whatever it is. And if you have any recommendations, please let it be known in the comment section below. Say, hey, you know what? I approached this game from this angle using these classes in this race and I really had a lot of fun but what I don't want you to do is min max this don't look at these things and say well he said play this level five don't do that if you don't want to I want you to play the class the race the the, the multi-class however the hell you want I just kind of try to give you a basic blueprint if you've never spiced in a multi multi-class or whatever it is so please have a lot of fun here there's so many options you could take advantage of in Baldur's Gate 3, and you don't know how many things that you've experienced on your first playthrough, which are drastically different every time you play. I'm, I have three or four congruent playthroughs running because I have, I'm making videos and I'm make, doing stuff for streams and stuff like that, and almost every interaction in the game has not been the same from playthrough to playthrough, and I have some that are the exact same style of, okay, I want this guy to be a good guy but I've maybe failed certain checks here and there that have made the conversation go at an entirely different angle. So this game has so much replayability baked into it. And it's not like the, the CRPGs of old where it's like binary of, okay, it's good or bad outcome. It's, there's a lot of gray in here. So have fun, enjoy yourself. And if you have any questions, by all means, let it be known in the comment section below. But thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.